why I believe there is a God. I'd like to share this with you. In this video, I will show you stories and views of what I see. I know some of you say you don't see God or miracles. I pondered about it. I felt I should share what I see. With hope you'd also see them. I know there's a God. I've seen some of you say you don't believe in God. I've felt for you. That is why I made this video. This is an old blacksmith shop. Old tools are scattered in this old time. Log structure, sometimes I'd come here to observe and wonder what it was like back then. This hot burning area cooks iron and then hammered to make different things. It's nice here. Anyway, I wanted to discuss about my childhood as a Christian child. I grew up in a wonderful family. My relatives were great. The community was also great. It was a small town. The church was really wonderful. School was good. My life was wonderful. I can't complain. Because of that, I was exposed to so many good people. There were Christians who had faith in God. I saw many miracles because of people of faith. I was exposed to people of great faith. I grew up thinking it was normal. It was all good when I grew up. I grew up and got older and older, got married and had a family. We moved around and were exposed to different people who didn't practice religion. They didn't believe in God. They didn't pray. Faith wasn't valued. The blessing of sick was a myth to them. I grew up witnessing healings. They were real. But in this world, some people didn't believe. I had to analyze the reasons I witnessed them while some of them didn't. These people might have been exposed to different kind of families that didn't go to church, they didn't pray. Families that didn't believe in healing of sickness. These people don't go to church. I had to step back and understand why some don't see God. Difference in cultures. However, I wanted to share my story. It's mine to share. You can take it or leave it. I'm not here to convince anyone. I just wanted to express why I believe. Growing up, I saw people that were close to death, either sick or from accidents. They might not live. I've seen family tragedies. At the same time, I've seen blessings of healing prayers, sickness and health blessings. I've seen them. And these people do recover. They were healed. They got better. Their situation improved. I witnessed them growing up with a faith-based life that I had. As a witness, I believed in God, for real. There were so many things that I witnessed. 
I had no doubt. That is why I cannot deny God's existence. I know he is there. I saw and I witnessed miracles. I can't possibly reject God. I can't. I would be lying to myself if I did. I am saying this because I see people's disbelief in God. It means they have not witnessed miracle. Why don't they see miracles? Their environment, family, and upbringing they did not practice. They didn't pray, didn't go to church. I can understand that. I can't judge them. Perhaps it's not their fault. However, they still have the responsibility to seek truth. I'm grateful for my life. I can't imagine any other kind of life where I would not know God. It's not for me. I also want to talk about God's history, his life, his knowledge, and his creation. All about God. It's deep, so deep, so wide, so high, we really cannot measure his life. His experience, knowledge, and history, it just can't be done. It's majestic, so large. It's beyond us. That is God, according to our belief. If you don't believe in God or didn't know God, that's fine. Just hear me out. This is my story, remember? God is amazing, like what I just explained. When I look at the Bible, I see God's words. It's the truth. And yet, looking at the Bible and God... I realized that the Bible is equivalent to one page of what God knows. One page is minimal compared to what God knows. His talent and his power is superior. Yet I see people argue and invest a lot of time and energy into one page. They argue about who's right and wrong. It's going in circles. They even mock atheists and non-believers. I don't agree with that. They are arguing over just one page of what God knows. We should be humble. It's just one page of what God knows. And the Bible is just one story from the Mideast related to Jesus Christ and the history involved, including Moses, Egypt, and so forth. It's a story of the Mideast. It's a really wonderful book. I respect the Bible very much. But it's just one story and one page of what God knows. You know, there are three categories of people. For some group of people, the Bible is very difficult to understand. They feel frustrated, so they seek help. With these people, one page is just too much. Too much for them. There's another group of people who read diligently. They study hard, and they are doing well. They discuss among themselves, they're doing good, they're doing their best. There is one other group of people who claimed it to be insufficient. There is no evidence, they claimed, it's insufficient. It can be too much for some people. Just right for some people, and insufficient for some people. Truth is, God cannot please everybody. 
He offered us some insights of what he knows. And it's overwhelming for some. Excitedly adequate for some. Insufficient for some. God can't please everyone. Remember again, it's equivalent to one page of what God knows. We need to be humble. Understand the meaning of faith. Faith is knowing and believing what we can't see. That's my discussion at this point. Let's talk about essences of prayers. Without prayer, we won't accomplish much. Numerous people claim to be very spiritual, but they give me a blank look when I asked if they pray. Well, don't you pray and seek Him? They become uncomfortable. Spirituality without prayers it is just not possible. I've met numerous spiritual people. They're oftentimes vague. They're not clear on things. They always claim to feel something. Oftentimes I'd ask if they'd prayed to seek him. No or not often, they'd say. What's up with their spirituality then? I'm a very spiritual person with understanding that I do it with prayers. Very important to include Him in my pursuit of answers. With spirituality, I include Him as I pray. I ask Him to guide me. That's the key. Prayers can be done anywhere. In your home. In a church or any place where you might find reverence. Or perhaps at the park. You sit quietly and say a prayer. It can be anywhere. I personally remember it's my story. Personally, I love to pray outdoors. I am fortunate to live out here in the country. I can pray anywhere. Sometimes I'd walk up these hills into the woods and find a quiet place to get on my knees and pray. Sometimes for a few hours, sometimes all day long. I'd talk, I mean real talk. Not just, our Heavenly Father, I need things done. Thank you, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. Then rush somewhere, no. I mean real effort in giving God your time. And talk. Listening is also part of a prayer. So you kneel down anywhere and talk. Connect, think, ask questions, share your feelings. Share your thoughts, share the happenings, and seek guidances. Talk with Him. Just like you talk with your biological parents. You sit and ask them things. It's having a genuine conversation with God. You will be surprised. He will reach out and answer. He might guide you through different channels. I know you may not have this kind of environment. I'm giving you my story. Oftentimes I'd go up a hill to pray and receive answers through good feelings. And sometimes I'd think of something, and I'd know it was from Him. Sometimes I'd see signs. Could be animals passing by, giving me warm feelings. You will know He's there. Different things could happen. I emphasize, I witnessed numerous answers. Because I pray often, and I go to places where it is really quiet. I give him all the time he needs with me. 
I pay respect and show humility. He will observe and he will connect with us. Oftentimes I see people pray briefly and repeat the words. It becomes meaningless. That has to be avoided. Because you don't see or hear God. Sometimes you need to look at how you pray and how you give him your time. Did you give him your time or were you in a hurry? Sometimes we're in a hurry so we're not listening to what he might have to say to us. When in a hurry God can't really talk to us. He'd have to wait until we quiet down, sit and ponder. When we seem ready, he will connect and answer. I emphasize that very much because God's time is precious. If I wanted answers, I need to show him that I am sacrificing my time for him. Sacrifice is the key part of prayer. You ask him for something, you should sacrifice something. You give him your time, express yourself, cry, show him your feelings, and ask. You will be surprised. Anyway, the nature is beautiful. When I see it, I cannot doubt God. It's easy for me to see sunset, sunrise, snow, rain. Cloud, sun, all the beautiful things on earth, and animals. I'm always in awe. It's so easy for me to know there is God. Those who don't see God, I think you, spend too much time inside your home or in your bedroom. You need to get out and see the world wondrous creations oftentimes I'm inspired by God's creations I have no doubts This morning, I glassed the woods and spotted an animal. I took a closer look and saw a bull moose. Its antlers fell off due to time of the year. And then I noticed strange spots on its body. I went to take a closer look to learn that it was piebald. It's partly albino. Albino is completely white. This one is part albino. It's called piebald. It's very rare. It's the first time I've seen one. I'm so thrilled. I wanted to show you. I will zoom in for you to see. Right now, he's resting and eating near the river. I'm excited to share this with you.
Other topic I wanted to discuss is myth of exclusiveness. It is important to understand the term exclusive means, for example, you wanted to watch a new release movie, but where can you watch it? Only on HBO, nowhere else. The reason is to make money and attract subscribers. They do it to control exclusiveness. It's an important word we notice around us. Where can I get it? Only at the store. It's the only place. Nowhere else. Exclusiveness. Now I want to discuss myth of exclusiveness. Of Bible and how many churches, religion, people, institutions... Used Bible as exclusive right to God's words. I've seen numerous instances where people would say, You won't find God's words anywhere else. You'll only find it in the Bible. Wow. That's the myth I wanted to talk about. Historically, God's words are found all over the world. God's words exist beyond the Mideast. Where Jesus Christ was born, historically with Moses and Egypt, in history, there were more global stories where God spoke to people way back in history and up to present time. He's still talking to people. His work is not done. His work continues. God's word are spoken still on daily basis all over the world. Many people wrote his messages. Signs, visions, including seeing something. They wrote about the wonders of God's work, but yet many Christians and churches dismissed them. The only place you'll find God's words is in the Bible. That's the sad part, because many people witnessed miracle happenings. They saw God's words, heard His spoken words, and felt His spoken words. People wrote about it, and they were largely dismissed by Christians and church people. That is why many people left church. Many people have doubts about Christians, and they have doubts about their Bible as the only place you will find God's words. People resented the notion. This discussion is important, emphasizing this with Christians, church people, and preachers. Stop using the Bible as exclusiveness, because... God's work is not over. Did God stop talking? No. There are so many stories out there where God actually touched people on a daily basis. The efforts to reject all that surely will not bear fruits for you We must be humble and recognize that God's work continues even to this day. He is still talking to people. He still does. Exclusiveness of the Bible is the only place you'll find God's words. It has to stop if we expect people to rediscover their faith in the Lord. If you are stubborn with your ways, claiming that the only place you'll find God's words is in the Bible, then it will cause collapse of church, collapse of belief, and collapse of faith. People will leave churches at a rapid pace. 
like some articles explained how numerous church members are dwindling in numbers, it's spiraling downwards. There's a reason for it. It does not just happen by itself. No, there's a purpose for it. There is a reason for it. The myth of exclusiveness is one of many reasons that has to stop. You know, creation's opposite term is destruction. I see some people wondering why God allows for destructions. How could God allow people to die? Why? It's a very common question that people kept asking. I thought I might offer a little bit of an explanation. It could be that people didn't understand his destruction because they didn't understand his creation. The nature of creation and the feelings when you create something. You expect it to turn out good. So when you create something that is wrong or defective, Sometimes you dispose or destroy what you created because you were not satisfied with it, it didn't meet your expectations, or because it went wrong, it is not what you wanted, it wasn't what you had in mind. So you dispose or destroy them. That's natural. It's a natural feeling. When I paint or draw, I am creating a picture. And if I am not satisfied, I dispose it. Why? Because I wanted something better than that. I expected something better than that, so I painted again. It's the same concept with God. When God created something that he didn't want, due to rebellion, disobedience, disobeying his commandments, he destroys them because he created them. It's his right to dispose of them. This place belongs to him. It's not ours, not yours, not mine, it's his. So it's his right to be dissatisfied with results and dispose of them. He has the right to because it is his creation. For example, if I painted something I liked and I showed it to you, but you didn't like it, so you destroyed it, but it wasn't yours, it was not yours to destroy because you didn't create it. I created it, so only I can destroy it. Same concept is why we should not kill people. We should not hurt others. We should not destroy the earth. We should not ruin the earth. Why? They are not our creations. We don't create people. So who created them? These people? Him. Who created this earth? Him. Therefore it is his to keep or destroy. Oftentimes God destroyed people because they do not keep their promises, they violate covenants, do not keep their words, and do not keep his commandments. He is not satisfied with his creation, so he disposes of them. I see some people asking if God was a murderer. If you said that, then it means you do not understand. Creation in the first place, no you don't. If you understand creation and the nature of the person who creates, the feelings of creating, their expectations, 
If you understood that, you'd understand why destructions happen. It's so obvious. Really simple to understand, but yet some people choose difficult paths for themselves. I want to emphasize other topic. I see an old log cabin, an old homestead. Not far from here. It's approximately 300 yards from where I sit. Old timers rode their wagons and horses to explore the wild west and settled in this beautiful country. They lived there and built a small log cabin. I will show it to you to give you an idea. It's impressive. It made me think about pioneers who did not have a hospital. Law enforcement, doctors, emergency help, or food supplies. Their survival was based on faith. They trusted the Lord and made progress for a better future. Their courage required faith. People who lived there had to have faith. Without faith, they would not be here. Faith and courage and search for a better future. Progress requires a lot of faith. Modern people don't see the value of faith because they have doctors, hospitals, police, schools, grocery stores, so they don't need God. I don't need you, God. If these old timers who lived there saw today, they won't believe it. I've traveled and seen numerous homesteads like it. Each time I see it, I'm reminded of people of great faith. Courageous people. Those modern people are foolish thinking they don't need faith because they have things. Time changes, yes. But I won't change because places like this remind me of why faith is really important. Yeah. Today is the fourth and final day, talking about leading by example. I commend Christians, religious people, and preachers for doing your best, but I have to be honest with you. The numbers of apostasy is increasing at an alarming rate. It means something is wrong. 
These people are trying to tell us something. We cannot afford to be prideful. We need to be humble and learn why. These people are leaving churches, leaving God, and rejecting the Bible. They have the answer if we're willing to be humble and listen. There is a famous saying, Easy come, easy go. Hard to get, hard to lose. The principle is whatever is easy for you to get, you will also lose it easily. Work hard to get and it will be loyal to you. It will stay with you. It will be hard to lose them. Hard is way better. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, did Jesus search for an easy way? Recruiting easy to convince people? No. Jesus went the hard way. Hard people were very hard. He labored and made time to be with them. He was patient with them by setting a good example. The people found him interesting and started to ask questions. Jesus was glad to teach. He recruited strong people. Jesus didn't go where it was easy. Jesus did not look for easy people to get. The principle is the same here. Many churches use scriptures because it's readily available. You keep poking at the scriptures and put a hole in it. That's the easy way. Preaching is the easy way, too. Knocking on people's doors is the easy way. So what is the hard way? Setting an example. Example takes a long time. You keep doing it patiently. The people will observe and test you for years and years. They will start believing that you are authentic. Then one day they will come and ask how. You do things and what your beliefs were. It will be our opportunity to share the Lord with them. They have a hard time trusting us, but our example brings them to us so that we can explain and help them understand the Lord. They are stronger than easy people. Oftentimes, church people are really lazy. It's also a form of abuse. These apostatized people are trying to tell us something. They are tired of our easy and lazy ways. They are hungry for example that's been lacking. I remember growing up. Preaching was not my thing. Scriptural thumping was not my thing either. I always believed that example was most powerful. And it's true. At one time, when I was 18 years old, the church asked if I was ready to serve on my mission. I told them I was not comfortable with preaching. Thumping scriptures was not my thing. The church understood and respected my decision. I said I was sorry. My life has been a far and wide missionary work. I traveled and met people for many years and years. I still serve the Lord every day for years and years. It's not limited to two years of missionary work. No, my work continues. By example, I do my work. There is always someone over there watching me. Always. And when they see how authentic I am, they will come and ask how I do things. I'll have the opportunity to answer them. This person will become very strong. They will believe in God. How? Not for my scripture thumpings. Not for my preaching, knocking, and bothering people. I do it by example, knowing they are watching me. As I kept doing it, knowing God's work will succeed, and we get a strong person. That's lacking in this world. There are not enough examples. Apostatizing people are trying to tell us something. They don't see examples out of us. They lose faith in the Lord. Who is at fault? Who is responsible? Not them. It's us. The Lord can't possibly be pleased with our lazy ways. 
He expects us to do the hard work, doing it with examples. Replace preaching with examples. Replace scriptural thumping with examples. Replace door knockings with examples. Examples always work. The other thing, people are tired of us. You bring them to your church. You expect something in return. Usually their money and manpower. But they only wanted to learn and to pray. Hopefully you will be able to analyze yourself and see what you are doing wrong because there are so many apostasies. It's too much. The Lord can't be pleased with that. No. Something is wrong. I hope these people will forgive us. Especially hope the Lord will forgive us for our lazy ways. Today is a beautiful day. I am grateful to the Lord for this opportunity so I could share this with you. Remember, this is my story. Perhaps you have different experiences, life, and stories, but this is mine. Thank you for watching. Our Heavenly Father, hear me, my Lord, hear my prayer. I thank ye for granting me the patience and strength so that I'd be an example to others. Help others so that they may also understand ye. I thank ye for the beauty of nature which serves as my conviction of your creation. I humbly ask for your protection. I say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.